Welcome to today's virtual turn up event. My name is Sergio Antonio Garcia and I am the Dallas City of Learning Program Manager for Big Thought. We are super excited to bring you this opportunity to show you some special access points for our friends at the Dallas Love Field and Frontiers of Flight Museum. Please stay tuned to win some prizes during our quiz game giveaway. Welcome back friends, we are super excited. We are still here at the Frontiers of Flight Museum and I have a new friend to introduce to you all today. We have... I'm Dan Steelman and I am the Vice President of Collections and Exhibits here at the Frontiers of Flight Museum. Dan, thank you so much for your time today. We're super excited to talk about what we are, uh, where we are right now in this museum. So tell us a little bit about what this spot in the museum is about. This is the SR-71 Gallery. Mm -hmm. And this is the world's only SR-71 flight simulator. SR, what does that mean, SR-71? SR-71, that was an aircraft created by Lockheed. Okay. And it was a reconnaissance, it was basically a spy plane. Ooh. It was the world's fastest and highest flying aircraft for many years, and it still holds records. Wow. Uh -huh. And uh, it's retired, uh, but at the time when it was flying, it flew for the... Uh, CIA and for the Air Force and for NASA and during that time that it was actually in flight this was what they used to train the pilots and keep the pilots and the uh, radar uh, operators uh, keep them up to date with all the latest changes with the airplane. So right here what we're looking at is what pilots used to train in to learn how to fly the the plane is that right? Right this is a simulator. Okay. Uh, the, not long after they started building airplanes they realized that it was kind of an expensive uh, proposition and kind of also one that was uh, not without some hazard mm -hmm. to learn how to fly. And so they tried to find cost-effective and safer ways to learn to fly. So they decided, uh, they came up with the idea of building a simulator. Simulating flight, ah. they were leaving the ground. So you're saying before we had simulators, they were actually putting pilots in planes to learn how to fly. Exactly. And that was a little too expensive and a little too dangerous? Uh, yeah, especially if uh, the pilot didn't know what they were doing. Uh -huh. You know, they're counting on the, the instructor to help them out. But a lot of times, uh, you know, it's not very forgiving. Yeah. <laughs> So they came up with the with the cost effective way, which is these simulators that one of the ones that we see yes. here. Is that right? right? This is a very complicated simulator. Mm -hmm. This took up an entire room and it was uh, at the time it was the, probably the most uh, complex simulator in existence. Oh. And like I said, it took up a whole room. You had banks and banks and banks of computers that were used to run this simulator. Now, somebody with a uh, PC or a Mac can plug in an app and they can, you know, they can learn how to fly, that, how way. To fly that way. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we're here in the Frontiers of Flight Museum and this particular wing actually holds multiple simulators, it does. right? Tell us a little bit right. about, about the history and what people can experience here about some of the different simulators. Sure. Be happy to. One of the first commercial simulators was built by a man named Edwin Link, L-I-N-K. Okay. And he wanted to fly, but he didn't have the resources available to fly. So he decided he tried to teach himself to fly on the ground. Okay. And so he built what they call the Link Trainer. The Link Trainer. Yes. And it became immediately, well, it, it became very successful mm -hmm. during World War II. Almost all American airmen trained using the Link Trainer. We have a version of it here. So how many simulators do you actually have here at the museum that, that folks can come and take advantage of or take a look at? We have three simulators here that uh, were all built by the Link Company. Okay. Because after uh, Edwin built that first one, mm -hmm. his company built, he created a company to continue building uh, simulators. And he built uh, one for the F-4 and he built, his company built this simulator. 
What? Long before he, Long, yeah, the, <laughs> way after Link himself. And we also have, a, if you are in the, our education program, mm -hmm. we have a room full of computers that have uh, simulators. And oh. you can actually try your hand at flying. We have a, over 42,000 kids last year came through and used our uh, STEM education program mm -hmm. here and they probably got a chance to uh, try their hand at flying nice without ever leaving the ground without ever leaving the ground so even, you didn't have to leave dallas ah uh, so we're uh i know that right now in COVID, it's a little difficult to do that these days but hopefully we'll get to a point to be able to have youth to come here and experience that so um what else about this museum and in this flight simulation wing would you like to let our friends out there know more about well, I'd love for them to uh, be able to look at our cockpit demonstrators. Okay. We have two of those, and those are not interactive things mm -hmm. like uh, the simulator. The simulator you actually fly. Okay. Okay. On the ground, but the cockpit demonstrators are more just places where they can get in, they can sit, and they can become familiar with the cockpit layout. Okay. And then they could test things like uh, emergency procedures so that it became second nature for them to know exactly what to do without second really nature. worrying about, uh, okay, where is the uh, ejection thing or, you know, that sort of thing. So then there's an opportunity for folks who visit the museum, which is actually open right now still they to the open. public. Mm -hmm. um, being mindful of social distancing and all, but they can come and experience that themselves of here. Course. Dan, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate that. I, I hope you all enjoyed this and learned more about flight simulation and we're looking forward to our next experience. Thank you so much. Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to our virtual turn up today. Uh, my name is Sergio Garcia, and I am the Dallas City of Learning Program Manager for Big Thought. And I am super excited to introduce you to... Senior Mechanic. Senior Mechanic. So, um, Refugio, tell us a little bit about where we are and um, what your position is. Like, what do you do? Uh, basically, we maintain all of our equipment. We maintain the airport. Uh, this is the SRE building, the small remodel equipment building. We keep all of the winter equipment in here. And uh, we basically maintain our airport inside and out. Uh, we time spaces. So, Refugio, are you uh, a native of Dallas? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Plain Grove, Southeast Dallas. I went to school out there, school there. So, you are from Pleasant Grove. I know we have a lot of our Pleasant Grove friends out there today. so. Here we are with somebody representing Pleasant Grove. That's amazing. I love that this is an amazing space. I've never been to the maintenance hangar here at Dallas Love Field. So tell us a little bit about what we are going to be featuring today. Uh, basically the, the rubber removal uh, truck, which is called a stripe hog. Stripe hog. The rubber, rubber removal truck stripe hog. So why are we removing the rubber? What does that mean? Rubber builds up on the runways. When the planes land, uh -huh. on the land, we rubber them out. I never really thought about that. So when you're saying the planes come in, obviously the rubber from their tires, they get on the on the runway. And so this machine here, the strike hog, takes away that rubber because it can become slick and ice in the winter. Is that right? And so that means the plane might, if that's not taken care of, it could slip and slide on there. Yeah, not stop in time. Not stop in time. Wow. So this is an essential equipment for all airports here. That's amazing. So what are, the, are some of the small or some of the, the features of this strike hog here? Uh, it uses water. Water? To uh, remove the rubber. How many gallons of water does it use? So about 3,700 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. That's like imagining all these gallons of chocolate milk out there. I'm super excited. Can we like maybe fire it up and see what it's all about? Or is there anything else that you want to feature here? Uh, tell you the heads. Yeah, let's, talk, let's heads. talk about these heads. The heads, they, uh, they spin uh, like 3,000 
hockey rink and they can fill up pressure, water pressure that takes the rubber up. It actually goes up to 40,000 pounds of pressure. 40,000 pounds of pressure, gosh. So these are the two big heads that help remove all the rubber. Uh-huh. So it scrubs it, cleans it, and then it sucks it back up all at the same time. All the way down to the concrete. Wow. I'm really interested to know about your career as a maintenance person. Um, I don't think a lot of our, our friends out there understand like the importance of maintenance people and that profession. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means for you and what your uh, decision to become a maintenance person is, a professional? Well, I was always in the mechanic and uh, kind of made my mind up when I was in study school. Okay. And I said, I'm going to go out and I'll do a mechanic part. I've been here for 16 years working on this equipment. You've been here for 16 years at Dallas Left Field as the senior maintenance manager here. You mentioned in high school you were a welder, is that right? I learned to weld. You learned to weld. Yeah, I learned to weld. Yeah. And so that was some of the skills that allowed you to become um, who you are today, is that right? Yeah. I wanted to see if there was one thing that you wanted our friends out there to take away from today, what you talked about or what it means to be a maintenance professional. What are some of your tips? Uh, it's, a good, it's a good trade. Uh, save you a lot of money. If you learn mechanic work, you pretty much fix anything. If you learn mechanic work, you can fix anything. That's a good tip. I know I should learn some of that. So I'm super excited. Let's try to fire up this thing and see what we can hear um, from the tripod. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you at the next virtual experience. Hello friends, welcome back. We are super excited about what we are going to feature today. So we have a new friend, please tell us who you are. Yes, my name is Bill Cole. Bill Cole? Mm -hmm. And Bill, tell us a little bit about what you do here at the, at the museum, at the Frontiers of Flight Museum. Well, I'm a docent, a volunteer, the red vest guy, and uh, I have the privilege of uh, showing folks around our, our wonderful museum. And in, in past years, I have participate in some of our educational programs yep. dealing with aviation and in fact we started a Boy Scout uh, Merit Badge Club here years ago and oh. or they took the classes here so uh, I just enjoy showing people our great displays especially this this area That's since awesome. I flew for Southwest Airlines for 24 years. So you mentioned that tell us a little bit about that so you said you flew for Southwest is yes. that right? Yes. So tell us a little bit about what brought you to Dallas are you from Dallas? 
Uh, no, actually, uh, my father was in the military. He was a sergeant in the army okay. and uh, had been in World War II. And, uh, so we moved around a lot mm -hmm. and uh, lived in Japan, a couple of different places in Japan, France, Germany. And I wound up in Texas uh, my junior year in high school over in Mineral Wells. My dad was at uh, Fort Walters, uh, it was called at the time. And uh, so I finished high school uh, in Texas. And did you go to the military yourself? Uh, yes, I was interested in flying. In fact, when we were living in Philadelphia, I was in the Scouts and I got interested in make, making model airplanes. And, okay. uh, that, that triggered my, my interest. So. so you're an actual pilot, right? Yes, yes, I had training in the military. So the military really afforded you an opportunity to get yeah. the training that yeah. you needed, mm -hmm. to pay for some of those trainings that yeah. were outside of all of that. Yeah. Um, and as you mentioned, as a, as, a, as a young child, as a youth, it actually afforded you an opportunity to explore the world, right? Sure. So oh, yeah. for some of our friends out there, um, if you're not looking to go into college and military might be an interesting career for you to start out in and give you some opportunities outside of that, this is a great experience and mm -hmm. story to hear that this afforded you that opportunity. Yeah. So Bill, um, before we go any further, tell us what we're looking at right here and what we're going to be talking about today. Well, we are in the uh, north end of the Frontiers of Flight Museum, and this is the Southwest Airlines section, this particular corner. Okay. We carried 137 people in this 300 series airplane. So I'm super excited. Now let's go ahead and go into this um, fuselage here and take a look at what we can see for the 737-300 series. Is that right? Sure. All right. So Bill, we are now inside the Boeing 737-300 series. How many people in this particular series could could ride in this plane? Like what was the passenger count? 137. 137. And this particular plane right now has a very special name. Can you talk to you a little bit about that? Well, it's called the Spirit of Kitty Hawk because uh, Herb uh, always likes a lot of good publicity. <laughs> and, uh, so when we got the first uh, three uh, or so airplanes, they picked this one, 300. It was the very first 737-300. Uh, the first flight was scheduled on the day that the Wright brothers, uh, to commemorate the day that the Wright brothers did their first flight in Kitty Hawk. At Kitty Hawk, so this so plane, plane is named after that. the spirit of Kitty Hawk for that reason. Well, Bill, thank you so much for your time today. Sure. This was very educational for me. Our friends out there, I hope you really enjoyed this segment. We are looking forward to the next thing that we're going to be showing you here at the Frontiers of Flight Museum. Thanks a lot, Bill. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Yeah. Pleasure. Welcome back, friends. We are here at the Ticket Center here at Dallas Love Field, and we are very excited to talk to you about our next art installation piece here. But first, I want to introduce a very familiar face to us and a friend. Please tell us who you are. I'm Kay Kalos. I'm the Public Art Program Manager for the City of Dallas Public Art Program. So some of you, um, Kay, thank you for coming today. Kay has actually been with us in our in-person uh, turn-up events in the past. So tell us a little bit about what you did in the past with the turn-up events. So in the past, I took families and children around on tours of the airport to look at public art and to help them understand what to look at and how to interact with the public art so that everybody could have a good time. So everybody can have a good time. Right. And so now, of course, we're taking this virtual experience to you today, this Saturday, for um, from the in-person to a virtual experience. Kay, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you come from. Okay, well, I come to Texas through a long route, but originally from the Midwest. Yeah. Although I lived in Atlanta for 20 years. Okay. And so I am originally an artist. You are. To make art. Nice. But I've had lots of other art-related jobs, such as being the dean of an art college, Ooh. being the director of Contemporary Art Center, wow. and an art history professor. An art history professor. Wow. So, like, you've been an artist yourself, you just mentioned. Tell us what kind of art you do. Oh, well, I do all kinds of art. I've done murals on the exterior of buildings. Mm -hmm. I've done, um, in, you know, regular size paintings and sculpture. So 
I also love ceramics, so I do whatever art is appropriate for the project I'm doing. Nice. And so now you said you were from Atlanta, and now you've been in Dallas. How long have you been in Dallas? I've been here 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. And you currently work for the city of Dallas? That's correct. And you, again, tell us who, what your position is. So I oversee the process of commissioning artists to do oh. artwork in public spaces for the city of Dallas Office of Arts and Culture. So you commission those artists. Right. <laughs> so if I can ask, can you give some of our artist friends out there a tip on how they might be able to engage with Dallas oh, and the city bet. of Dallas? What would be a good tip for them? Go to dallasculture.org and click on the public art page. And that will give you lots and lots of information about what is here, what the opportunities for new projects are, and there are many, mm -hmm. and the process that you need to undertake to do that. Awesome. We also have workshops several times a year, and now we're working on a virtual workshop so that artists who want to become public art artists can learn how to do it. So there are workshops that artists can take out of, uh, that can take advantage of to be able to be a public arts, public artist. Is that right? That's correct. That's amazing. I didn't actually know that that was happening. That is super awesome. Is that a free resource? Um, it's a nominal fee. A nominal just fee. To cover lunch. Oh, there you go. So that's a great resource for you young artists out there looking to be a public artist. Again, go to where, Kay? DallasCulture.org. DallasCulture.org. So we're here to talk about some very special art installation pieces. So tell us what we're looking at today right here in the background. So we're looking at windows that Window. are now in the, in the Claire story or the, above, the window above the main frame area mm -hmm. that were once part of a church. So these windows Dallas. were once part of a church. Right. Okay. And they were part of the church on Gaston Avenue that was done uh, by, the windows were done by a man named Octavio Medellin. Octavio Medellin. Correct. Nice. Octavio came here from Mexico in the 1940s okay. and established an art school, taught many of the artists who are active in Dallas today and his work is collected all over the United States in the Museum of Modern Art, wow. the Dallas Museum of Art, and many other places. So he was a very important artistic force mm -hmm. for making art and for teaching artists how to become artists at that time. So Octavio came from Mexico Correct. to the States yes. here. Did he study here in Dallas? No, no, he no. studied all over. And, he studied all he over. Started, uh, he worked as an artist here and then started a school here for other artists. Here in Dallas? Yes. So Octavio studied a little bit here and then made a school here in Dallas. That's right. amazing, wow. And that school continues on today. Today it is called the Creative Arts Center. The Creative so Arts Center. Any artist or anybody who wants to learn about art can go to the Creative Arts Center and get the kind of instruction that Octavio started out in the 1950s. I am very familiar with the Creative Arts Center. Hello out there. They are a partner of the Dallas City of Learning ecosystem. Indeed. So they are so uh, such an amazing resource for artists out there to learn. And that's, uh, I didn't know idea of that connection. That's amazing. So tell us a little bit more about these windows. Actually, what are the name? I don't believe I got the name of what these windows are called. It's just called Claire Story Windows, which is a description of where it is located. And originally, it was on what is called a campanile. Campanile. A, a tower. Okay. So if you think of these all put back together and then turned upward, so they're vertical instead of horizontal, uh -huh. it was outside of the bell tower of the church on Gaston Avenue. Oh. We looked all over when we were trying to save these windows because the church was demolished to oh. make the YMCA. So when we went to save them, we had to look all over to find the right home mm -hmm. for these windows because they're very special for two reasons. Yeah. Not only because they're artwork by uh, Octavia Medellin, but also because they represent an experimental fused glass technique that he developed. Fused glass. So it's not just standard stained glass. Okay. It's fused glass, which is taking pieces of glass uh -huh. and heating them to up to their temperature and then they fuse together. Wow. And then he actually painted on the tops of some of them. Um, and so it's a very different technique of making um, colored glass windows. And it was something that he developed. So this is like, we're actually seeing kind of a new technique being used yes. at this moment. That's amazing. That's right. So this is like actual part of art history and art education. It's true. 
Wow. And they were they, they were made in 1963. Okay. And the entire redesign of the airport is based on mid-century style. Okay. So they're completely consistent with the stylistic approach of the redesign of the airport or the modernization of Love Field. So 1960s is kind of the mid-century design Correct. fad in yes. the art world and right. these windows and the architecture of Dallas Love Field fit all into that. That is correct. That's amazing because we were just talking about earlier how architecture is art that we live in right. in that respect and so this is all tying that together. Exactly. Kay, what is your favorite um, part about this art installation piece? The texture on the windows is quite amazing. Go and look at them. Each pane of glass has a different texture mm. as well as color. So, so it's almost like sculpture with glass as well as painting with glass. Wow. So that's, it's very interesting from that standpoint. That's amazing. My other favorite thing about them is that many people recognize these windows. I came across a woman one day. She was just standing and gazing up at the window, <laughs> a little teary-eyed. And, and I stopped and I said, do you know what these are? She said, yes, they used to be in my church. And so it was a, a wonderful recognition of something that was familiar to her. And many people have that experience. That's amazing. So a woman who actually recognized because she used to go to that church right. and recognize these windows, these right. paints from being in there. Right. That's amazing. So Kay, before we leave today, what is one thing that you want to tell, tell our friends out there that they can take away about not only this piece, but artwork here at Dallas Left Field? Well, or anywhere. <laughs> or anywhere, but here at Love Field especially. All of the artwork is here to talk about the legacy, the history, the qualities of Dallas. Mm -hmm. So it all relates to this particular place. That's amazing. Whether it's Octavia Medellin's windows or whether it's the medallions over here in the, in the ticketing hall that tell us about Dallas's history. And so you learn about Dallas by looking at these works. Each person can look at them and take yeah. away some little piece of Dallas history with them to enjoy. And they're all very fun. You yeah. can interact with them in many different ways. That's amazing. So all these art installation pieces here at Dallas Left Field mean something to the history of Dallas. That's right. That's awesome. Kate, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you for educating us on these windows here. We hope that you all enjoyed this particular segment. You all have a good day, and we will see you back in the next segment. Welcome back, friends. We are back here at the Frontiers of Flight Museum, and I have a new friend to introduce to you today. Please tell us who you are. Hello, my name is Ian Gray. I am an educator here at the museum. I specialize in astronomy programs and physics, and I also portray uh, Dr. Moonwalker for some of our living history programs. Awesome, Ian, so you, you work here at the Frontiers of Flight Museum. Tell us a little bit more about the work that you do here. 
So, uh, most of my work involves the uh, planetarium, our Space Portal Odyssey capsule, or Spock for short, <laughs> because we're a bunch of nerds at the museum. Yeah. I'm very proud of that. And uh, it is our portable planetarium system, so we take it out to schools, we have it here for events. Uh, we really like doing uh, planetarium programs uh -huh. because we really are engaged with astronomy content and we are an air and space museum yes. here. And the problem is a small enclosed uh, canvas dome uh, doesn't work so well in the current climate we have. Mm -hmm. So what I've been working on at the museum is trying to get that uh, with the ability for us to stream and record programs and that is going well and so hopefully we'll hear more about that soon. So that's called Spock, right? Yes. So what does Spock stand for again? Our Space Portal Odyssey Capsule. Space Portal Odyssey Capsule Spock. Awesome. So we are standing in front of this particular piece of equipment here. Tell us what this is, Ian. This is a spacecraft. Yes, this is Apollo 7. Apollo 7. It was the first manned mission in the Apollo program to go into space. Oh, OK. And so after Apollo 1 mm -hmm. and the tragedy on the launch pad, they paused the Apollo program. And Apollos 2 through 5, uh, 2 through 6, were all unmanned. Okay. And so they were testing each one of the systems individually to make sure that every part of the rocket and every part of the command module mm -hmm. and the service module would actually work and keep the astronauts alive and safe. And so Apollo 7 spent 10 days and 20 hours over 163 orbits going around the Earth meticulously testing every system. Oh and was the most successful test flight they, NASA had ever had at that point. And so this particular model just went around the Earth. It didn't actually go to the moon. Yes, and it's not a model. This is the actual capsule that oh, wow. went into space. Wow. And you can see around, there's the heat shield shielding. It is scorched. It has survived re-entry and almost 11 days in space. So we're looking at this module here. Yes. Um, on the actual rocket, or what do you call it when th this sits on? This is the command capsule, and this was the very top of the Saturn rocket. So okay. this one launched on the Saturn 1B, which was much smaller mm -hmm. than the eventual Saturn 5 that would go to the moon and launch Skylab later. This was just meant to get it into orbit around the Earth. Around the Earth. And test the systems for the command capsule, which is this and the service module, which was underneath it. And so altogether, that was the spacecraft. The service module was detached for the command okay. capsule to land on Earth. So this was launched in October 9th through the 22nd mm -hmm. of, oh, so about 11 days. Okay. Uh, in 1968. 1968. And to give you an idea of the breakneck pace of the Apollo program, mm -hmm. it would be July 1969, the next year that Apollo 11 would land on the moon. Wow, so that's what, eight months or so? That's how quickly they were able to go from one to the next to the next? They were testing each system. Apollo 8 went around the moon. Uh -huh. Apollo 9 took the lunar module with them and tested that. Apollo 10 did a rehearsal landing, almost landed and came back up, and then Apollo 11 finally landed. Wow, so that was an actual like space race like they were saying. Yes. Trying to be the first to be to land on, on the moon. moon. And this was the first part of that journey of that race, this Apollo 7 module. Yes, and so the space race had gone all the way back to the first manned missions with Gemini and the uh, Russian early uh -huh. space program. But at that point, America didn't have the first man in space, didn't even have the first woman in space, and had been losing the space yeah. race. And so Kennedy said, we have to get to the moon. Mm -hmm. And that's what kicked off the Apollo program. And we got to the moon. Wow. And it was about 400,000 technical staff with NASA and about 20,000 companies that got the together technicals. and made the Apollo missions possible. So Ian, what are some of the skill sets that somebody needs to be involved in in a project like Apollo 7? Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Oh, absolutely. So anything having to do with STEM, mm. so science, technology, engineering, math are critical for getting a project like this mm -hmm. to actually happen. And so you have scientists, you have engineers, you have manufacturers, you have people from, again, thousands of companies and universities working together to solve these problems. But even uh, outside of STEM, there's a lot of people who also have to go in and support that. Not everybody can be a scientist or an engineer. There's also the people administrating these massive projects. Mm -hmm. There's people who are physically making these things, like sewing the spacesuits and getting the materials together and actually making the integrated circuits and all of these things that go into it. So when we talk about STEM, we also here at Big Thought and Dallas City of Learning like to talk about STEAM, the arts part of that and having a creative mind um, as an artist can also be applied to some of the stuff that we see here, right? Exactly. All of this had to be designed mm. first. All of this had to be drawn up. This didn't just come out of nowhere. Teams of people came together and researched and designed and physically drew out what was necessary mm -hmm. for this. And back in that day, it was physically drawing it. Yeah. And so nowadays we draw everything in computers, but it's still the same skill set. Illustrators and designers yeah. and architects and these people who make these engineering challenges into actual shapes that we can use all of these people are necessary for it. That's amazing. Um, so before we close this out, Ian, what is your favorite part about this particular Apollo 7 module like that you want people out there to take away from here? Oh, I think my favorite part of it is seeing the heat shield mm -hmm. and seeing how the force of reentry and the heat that this spacecraft endured to get both up into space and then coming back, uh -huh. seeing the impact of that on the insulation on the underside and seeing where the umbilical was cut, where it was connected to the rest of the rocket, uh -huh. it really shows that this went to space. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Ian, thank you so much for your time today, for all the amazing facts and, and information that you were able to tell us today about the Apollo 7 module. Friends, you can come to the Frontiers of Flight. They are still open, as we've mentioned before, and you can see this in person yourself. Thank you so much, Ian, and thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Some new and interesting things are happening here at Dallas Love Field, where they're integrating human workers with an automated luggage handling system. So while there are humans behind the scenes checking bags, the bulk of the luggage handling system is done by a robot-run baggage system created by the Japanese company Daifuku that runs along the tracks that you see, see behind us here and also robot carts carrying the bags from place to place. This system uses a series of mobile inspection tables, or MITs, that deliver the luggage automatically to the TSA workers and then back to the conveyor belts. And that's sweet really for them because I know that on more than one occasion, I've gone over my luggage limit. Dallas Love Field is the fourth airport in the United States to adopt this innovative system, joining other cities like Detroit, Cleveland, and Orlando, which recently installed the system in its airport. One neat fact about Love Field, however, is it's the only airport currently using the Daifuku robot handling system to process all of the luggage that is checked at the airport. You know, this luggage system can process over 3,200,000 bags annually, which makes me think, how many bags is it processing daily? That's a really interesting question and sounds like something we need our whiteboard and a handy calculator for. So if the luggage handling system is processing 3,200,000 bags annually, that's that number of bags over 365 days. So let me get to my calculator. So... 3,200,000 divided by 365, if you round up, that comes out to about an average of 9,000 bags a day. That's a lot of bags. We did some research and we know that bags can enter the system at a maximum of 1,800 bags per hour, which makes me wonder how many bags are entering the system per second. That's a really interesting question. So let's get out our whiteboard again or clear it off to do some math. This would have to be at a super, on a super busy day at the airport if we're thinking about the numbers that we're going to calculate here. So the rate is 1,800 bags per hour maximum. 
and we know that one hour is actually equal to 3,600 seconds because there are 60 minutes in an hour and each of those minutes is 60 seconds. So let's divide 1800 by 3600 and that tells us that about one bag per every two seconds can enter the system. If the system were operating at maximum capacity, so it would have to be super busy to hit the airport. That's really fast and just gives me a better sense of how efficient the system is as a whole. Welcome back friends, we are super excited for what we are going to be featuring you today right now. But first I want to introduce our new friend here. Please tell us who you are. Hi, my name is William Stinnett. Well, yep. Uh, I'm a senior educator here at the Frontiers of Flight Museum and I love being able to come here uh, whenever the opportunity uh, arrives. So William, are you from Dallas originally? Yes, uh, born and raised in South Oak Cliff. South Oak Cliff, yep. nice, that's awesome. And so tell us a little bit about the work that you do and what brought you to come to Frontiers of Flight. Well, uh, my background, I'm prior military. I was an aircraft mechanic in the Air Force for a little over seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, once I got out, I wanted to uh, pursue a uh, pursue education and to uh, be able to also be, uh, still be around uh, aircrafts. So being able to come to the museum allowed me to uh, become an educator and still be able to teach uh, and being able to teach students about aviation, uh, how planes are able to fly, yeah. this parts over there as well. So you actually teach full time as well, yes. is that right? Yes. And where uh, do you do that? So there's a school uh, in Irving called Aviation Institute of Maintenance. Uh, there I'm able to teach students to become aircraft mechanics. Uh, so I am a licensed uh, aircraft mechanic, mm -hmm. uh, airframe and power plant mechanic. So I'm able to work on any aircraft in the U.S. Uh, Whoa, so, yeah. any aircraft in the U.S. And so what does that mean? Like what made you want to become an aircraft mechanic to get into that? What are some of the things that brought you to that journey? Well, uh, one thing I was good at as, uh, as a kid was being able to break things. Uh, <laughs> the struggle was being able to fix things. Yeah. So, uh, being able to... Uh, just learning to fix things, being able to work with my hands. Just being around planes, I love being around planes. And so from South Oak Cliff, you became an aircraft mechanic. Yep. And now that brings us today, here today at the Frontiers of Flight Museum. And I hear you're one of the experts here to talk about what we're gonna talk about today. Tell us what we're talking about today. So today we're talking about our Tuskegee Airmen. Mm -hmm. uh, these, uh, this amazing group of men and women they were able to uh, change the world, especially mm. during their time in World War II. Uh, they were their first uh, African-American uh, group to be pilots, uh, being able to uh, actually go to the front lines and being able to uh, help fight the war. 
So the Tuskegee Airmen were in World War II, yes. right? Yes. And the first African American flight crew, or how, what? What, is, what do you so, call them? So when it comes to the Tuskegee Airmen, they're not just uh, the aviators. They're the maintenance people. Okay. They're the supply people. So they're the first ones to. Uh, be able to also fly because uh, at that uh, period of time, mm -hmm. uh, African Americans wasn't uh, weren't allowed to fly. So for them to be able to have their own group and Americans to be part of the military was very unique and it was uh, very important to, uh, for them. And one thing that you actually that I just picked up on right now that you said these were men and women, yeah. right? Yes. In the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, so tell us a little bit about more about the women involved well, in this. Uh, for the women, uh, it was more of the uh, being able to do things as far as helping with supply, mm -hmm. uh, because women played a huge role uh, in a war effort. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to uh, being able to uh, help uh, bring planes over, because uh, when it came to uh, this particular group. They were able to help with supply, mm -hmm. the nursing side of things, uh, and uh, doctors as well. So it was a whole group of people with that. Wow, that's amazing. So I don't think we hear often about the women involved in, in the Tuskegee Air, Airmen group and all of that. So that's, that's great to hear. And that's really empowering to hear that from you that women were a... a, a, a a force in that, like a driving force in that, a huge support in that process. Well, uh, one of the most uh, influential women of that period, uh -huh. uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, the uh, first lady, mm -hmm. uh, because she had the ear of the president, she was very influential in allowing uh, for there to be the Tuskegee Airmen. Oh. Uh, because there was a lot of people mm -hmm. who didn't want the Tuskegee Airmen to be a thing, mm -hmm. but because of her uh, progressive mo uh, ways, uh, helped to make that happen. And so we have a, a uniform back here and some medals in yes. the Tuskegee Airmen. Can you tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here? So uh, this right here is a, uh, it's a dress uniform. So uh, for this, you'll see how they have their medals. It has their aviation wings as well, mm -hmm. their aviator wings. Uh, with these wings, it is basically their license of being able to say that they're a pilot. So that's what you're able to see. Okay. Uh, you're also able to see uh, additional medals uh, down below as well. And so I'm actually reading here about first, cry, uh, first class um, Buford and so Marshall. I'm actually is that he is from Texas himself, yes. and he went to Booker T. Washington High School. Is that yes. here in Dallas or there? Yeah, uh, here in Dallas. So he's actually from Dallas. We have a Tuskegee Airman that was actually from Dallas. Yes. That's amazing. So that's Private First Class Buford Marshall, who was a Tuskegee Airman from here in Dallas. Yes. Wow, that's amazing. Yep. So uh, then the reason why they have the name of Tuskegee Airmen mm -hmm. is because they did their training in Tuskegee, Alabama. Tuskegee, so, yeah. I was gonna ask you that. So where does the name Tuskegee come from? So that's a place in Alabama? Yes, yes, it's a, so it was a college and it got uh, converted into a military flight school. Okay. And that's where they went to do their flying. What's your favorite part about all of this, about the history here? The, the fight. The fight. Uh, so you have a group of amazing people who threw everything thrown against them uh, from people not uh, wanting them to fly, thinking that they're not smart enough, mm -hmm. thinking that they aren't good enough. And they showed them, they showed the people that disliked them, they showed the U.S. and they showed the world that they are just as good as anybody out mm -hmm. there. Uh, from them being one of the most decorated groups in uh, the, from the U.S. Uh, during World War II wow. uh, because of how well they were able to fly to being wow. able to maintain uh, the aircraft. And it was just, it's just an amazing group of uh, people just to talk about and to uh, always be able to uh, see. One fun fact about the Tuskegee Airmen is their aircraft. This right here is their P-51 Mustang. Uh, one little unique uh, thing that you'll be able to see is its tail. It is nice and red. Uh, this is what they are also known as, the red tails. So whenever you hear about red tails, this is what they're talking about, their aircraft. Uh, it is a marker to allow not only their group, but also allies and enemies to know who they are. So whenever they see the red tails coming, they know that there's a fight. William, thank you so much for your time today. Please oh, come yes. to the Frontiers of Flight Museum. Maybe you can meet William sometime here. Learn more about the Tuskegee Airmen. Thank you so much. 
Good afternoon, everyone. We are back. We are here at Love Landing, one of the many art installations pieces here at Dallas Love Field. And I'm super excited to introduce our next friend here with our virtual turn up event. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Drema Chavez. I'm a public art coordinator for the City of Dallas Public Art Program. So Drema, you are a public, you work with the Public Arts Installation Program? That is correct. For the City of Dallas? Correct. So are you from Dallas? I am from Dallas. I grew up in East Dallas. East Dallas? That's yes. awesome. So you've made a career out of being um, an art installator or what does that mean? Tell us a little bit about what that work is about. So what I do is I um, manage the art, the site specific projects for the entire city of Dallas. Oh. And that means that that's from planning phases into fabrication and installation and dedication. Wow. And because Love Field is a city run um, airport, uh -huh. that's how we are involved in, in the art projects here. So this building is actually owned by the city, is that Correct. right? And so that brings you in to be able to do all these wonderful, amazing art installation pieces, That's right? Correct. So do you have an art background yourself? I do. I have a Bachelor of Arts in Art History. Art History. Yes. So like this is perfect for you to be able to do these types of art installation pieces here at Dallas Love Field. Absolutely. You don't necessarily have to be an artist to be involved in artwork. Do you hear that? You don't have to be an artist to be involved in artwork. Correct. Love that. That's amazing. So we're here to talk about a very special piece here at Dallas Love Field. So what are we talking about today that we see in the background here? Well, in the background, we see Dixie Friend Gay's North Texas Sunrise. And it is one of our largest commissions. Mm -hmm. It is 18 feet tall by 64 feet long. 18 and feet tall by 64 feet long. That's correct. Wow. And what it depicts, they, these are all um, Texas native spring flowers. And so it includes the Mexican hat, which is probably the tallest one that you see there. Okay. It also includes wine cups, and of course it also has the Texas blue bonnet, our the, Texas. The Texas blue bonnet, which is our state flower for Texas. And so tell us a little bit about the history of this piece and how it came to be here. Well, um, Love Field underwent a renovation a little over 10 years ago, mm -hmm. which included 11 projects. Uh, for the new terminal, and uh, North Texas Sunrise was one of those projects. And so the process for that, it starts as a painting. The artist, Dixie Frank Gay, creates a painting. She sends it to her fabricators in Montreal. They printed out a scale size printout mm -hmm. of the artwork, and then they start hand matching, hand cutting all the ceramic tile and small tea and lay it and place it on top of that printout. Wow. They ship it down to us and um, it took about 30 days for artists and her for the artist and her team to install install the artwork. So it took 30 days to install this artwork? Exactly. And you, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but so what is this made out of? What are we looking at? What are the materials? that we see in this, this art. This is a mosaic wall, which is actually one of the most ancient mediums that oh. artists work in today. Mosaic. And so what, it's mosaic tile. It's all hand painted, hand formed, hand cut, and small tea glass. So it's glass and ceramic? Correct. Oh, wow. So I'm super excited when you all do come through here, once we're able to like travel a lot more, I really encourage you to take a look at this mosaic piece by, again? Dixie Friend Gay. Dixie Friend Gay, she's the artist. Brema, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate. Friends out there, there are so many different places here at Dallas Love Field. We're gonna get to see another, more, another one, but take a look around your surroundings. There is art everywhere. Even the buildings that we are living in is considered art. Architecture is art that we live in. Again, thank you so much, Drema, for your time yeah. today. Thank you.
hope you enjoyed today's virtual Turnup event. Dallas City of Learning Digital Exploration is always here for you. Feel free to follow us on all social media to learn about this and much more. Thank you to our friends at Frontiers of Flight and Dallas Love Field. We hope you enjoyed today's event because I know I sure did. See you next time from Dallas City of Learning.